Hey guys, my name's Sam Willis and I'm the senior lecturer for the Australian Paramedical College. In today's session, we're going to talk about tension pneumothorax and needle chest decompression. Now these two topics really do go hand in hand. Even though there are different types of pneumothorax, in this session we're going to talk about what a pneumothorax is, what it looks like, and how you as a paramedic can actually treat this patient using a large 14 gauge cannula. Okay, so let's get going. In this session, to be more specific, we're gonna look at the, the urgency of, of decompressing a chest because when you're dealing with the patient who's sustained significant chest trauma, and they, they are actually demonstrating the signs of symptoms of a tension pneumothorax, you really do need to be able to act fast. And that includes recognizing the urgency of it, as well as actually using the, a large ball cannula to decompress to let the air out of the chest. We're gonna look at the signs and symptoms, and we're gonna look at the exact skill of decompression. So let's try and use this as a case study then. This is a situation you may find yourself in as a state paramedic. It's a busy Friday night. You've been called to a local hotel in the city where there are reports of a male who's been stabbed. On arrival, the male is slumped against the wall of the hotel, struggling to breathe, and is holding the left side of his chest. He has a pale face, blue lips, and a GCS of 12, comprised of E3, V4, and M5. So let's go through this case study together. So it's Friday night, so that means that the call volumes go up, the amount of vehicles available to respond go down, and therefore you are already, as a human being, going to be pretty fatigued. So when you arrive at scene, it's outside, it's a Friday night, people drinking in the city, um, Therefore, there's clearly safety concerns here. Now, it doesn't mean you need the police in every situation. However, you've got the situation where there's obviously lots of alcohol involved. Somebody's been stabbed. This is one of those situations where you are going to need to know where the assailant is and to get the police on scene quickly. And the reason you need the police is because you don't know in that crowd of people whether or not the person who stabbed him is actually one of, that per one of those people. The male slumped against the wall of the hotel, struggling to breathe. Now, you know as well as I do, if somebody's slumped against a wall, hunched over, then that's not a good sign because number one, it will compromise their breathing mechanisms. And number two, if they're not able to look after themselves, stand up and get themselves to hospital or do whatever they need to do, that's, a, that, that's not a good sign. Holding the left side of his chest. Now the final point here, pale face, sign of hypoxia, low levels of oxygen, blue lips, cyanosis, and a reduced GCS, all of these things are not good. Now the good news is, with your education and training, knowing that somebody's been stabbed, knowing that somebody can't breathe and they're holding the left side, you now know that you may need to do a tension, a tension decompression. In other words, a needle chest decompression or a chest decompression or, man, or whatever they, they call it, different names for the same thing. In other words, you've got to get a large 14 gauge cannula and stick it in the chest. But you've got to do some, some assessments of your patient first before you go off and do that. So attention pneumothorax is a life-threatening condition. Let's be clear on that. Now there are different types of pneumothorax, but when you get to tension, what's happening is the air inside your chest cavity, not inside your lung, but inside your chest cavity, is pushing everything to one side. And what that's doing is, number one, it's reducing the amount of oxygen available to the tissues because there's less oxygen because the lung, it's not, you're not ventilating properly. And number two, you're starting to quash and squash the other side. In other words, you're starting to squash the heart and the other lung to the point where at some point that patient will go into cardiac arrest. When you're faced with a traumatic cardiac arrest, the latest guidelines from the Australian Resuscitation Council tell you to immediately decompress a chest. That's how serious this is. And in fact, they don't just say decompress it. They say treat the... the, the, the tension pneumothorax above and beyond doing CPR because they say without this the CPR is going to be pointless anyway and again showing you how urgent this situation really is. Acute treatment involves rapid recognition and decompression of the chest which is something we are going to talk about and of course you'll have different levels of unconsciousness and consciousness and of course you as the paramedics got to try and work your way through a systematic approach to work out if you are or are not going to do this skill. So let's take a quick look at this image then. So here you can see a normal lung on this side. 
Whereas on this side, you've got a smaller collapsed lung that's being compressed by all the air. Now, what tends to happen is with a tension pneumothorax, there's some kind of mechanism such as being stabbed in the chest. Now, the air will either come into the, into the trachea here, go into the lung, and instead of going back out through the trachea and being breathed out, will actually end up going out through the damaged lung and being stuck in this cavity because it can't get back through and, and out through this mechanism. And every time the patient breathes in, it's really, really painful for that patient. And not only is it painful, but the air's not going out, so they feel like they're starting to suffocate as well. Uh, and here you can see at the bottom some symptoms of tension pneumothorax, and it includes chest pain, shortness of breath, rapid heart rate, shallow breathing, anxiety, blue or ashen skin. So the chest pain is really is um, caused by the, when you're breathing in, it's a sharp stabbing chest pain caused by the trauma and the movement of the chest under the after the trauma. Shortness of breath is because you're actually, your lung is being quashed and squashed. Rapid heart rate is a sign of obstructive shock. Shallow breathing, obstructive shock. Anxiety because you're suffocating, so it will make you anxious. And blue or ashen skin is a sign of hypoxia. If you were to take an x-ray, this is what a tension pneumothorax would look like on an x-ray. Just be mindful that anything on an x-ray that is white is solid. So here you can see the, um, the clavicles, you can see the ribs, you can see all the other, uh, the, all the other bones. This, this organ here is the heart and you've got the diaphragm down here. Anything on here that is black is air. So here you quite clearly you can see that the, the x-ray is picked up the air around the patient. But what you also notice is that this part here, this where the, where the tension pneumothorax is, there's a lot more air in the patient's left side. This is the patient's left. There's a lot more air in this side than there is in the other side, in the patient's right. You can also see that you've got this deviation of the trachea, which is normal because it's being pushed. It's not normal, it's pushing everything towards the patient's right. And for me, the biggest thing is it just screams out at you how there's what we call a hyperinflation of the patient's chest. In other words, there's, there's so much more air inside the chest cavity when you compare it to this side. So the signs and symptoms where we've got to really spend a little bit of our time, because this is where it all comes down to you being able to recognize. Now I've split it down into two main types of signs or symptoms, the key signs and symptoms and anything else that is really, really important, but it's not gonna help you to identify tension pneumothorax. Number one, trauma-related mechanisms of injury. So that can be a stab, stabbed in the chest, shot in the chest, shot in the back, stabbed in the back, fall from height. Maybe you've landed on their chest. Maybe they've, uh, maybe they've landed on their chest, not you. you know, that would be crazy. Maybe they've been hit by a moving vehicle. Um, so there's got to be some kind of mechanism of injury that suggests thoracic trauma. Then there's got to be signs of obstructive shock which just means that there's an obstruction and it's causing tachycardia, difficulty in breathing, all the signs and symptoms that you know to be shock. And if you can't remember those signs and symptoms, now's the time to get back into the books and look at the different types of shock and how they present. Diminished breath sounds on the side of the injury. So when you have a listen with a stethoscope, you'll hear normal breaths, silent chest or diminished, normal silent. So you really are going down and you're comparing left to right with your stethoscope. You might also end up with the hyperinflated chest that we saw on the x-ray. So not only will there be more air inside that chest cavity, but there will also be uh, a marked difference in the way the patient sits eventually. So if the injury is on this side, you'll see more air in this side. And eventually the trachea, you'll get midline shift later on, but it's re really late signs. Everything gets pushed that way. And of course, you'll also get this thing called hyper-resonance on percussion. And of course, when you percuss, you keep one finger on the chest and you're tapping on the, on the finger using the other fingers. And again, you're comparing left and right. Anything that is solid will sound dull. Anything that is full of air will sound resonant. And when there's a lot of air, it will sound hyper-resonant. So those really are your key, mechanism, your key signs of symptoms. Then everything else that you see here, reduced level of consciousness, late sign. Signs of hypoxia, pretty late. Pain on inspiration, that's not late. And aggression and confusion, again, 
that can happen when there's hypoxia. And all the other signs and symptoms tend to relate around um, the late stages of tension pneumothorax, including tracheal deviation and other signs of hypoxia. So now we get on to talking about the actual skill itself. Now, believe it or not, the skill is actually pretty simple to do once you've um, recognized it. Now, just remember when you're coming to make the decision as to whether or not you are or are not going to decompress the chest, then you can actually do this by talking to your crewmate and discussing the signs and symptoms your crewmate might have more experience in this than you. Remembering that you're gonna be sticking this large 14 gauge cannula through your patient's chest wall. So if there's any doubt or uncertainty, do communicate, use your non-technical skills. Now, generally speaking, this is the equipment you need, a large bore 14 gauge cannula or larger. Some ambulance services have a very specialized needle that the, that the, um, that the armies tend to use, which has got a three-way tap built into it, and they're larger than 14 gauge. But most services, because they're generally a rare occurrence, you, they, they won't invest in the extra items of equipment. So you'll see this based upon, between service and service, you might see that some services have these huge needles, others just use these 14 gauge cannulas, which are fine. But what you have to remember is, once you've inserted this needle and you've removed the needle, this is what's gonna be kept in place. And of course, when your patient's exhaling all the airs, you know, what, the purpose of this is to allow the patient, all that trapped air to be released. And if the tiny, if this cannula is tiny, that's the only amount of air that will be able to leak out through, through this tiny catheter, meaning they may have another tension in the thorax again. So this, having a 14 gauge isn't ideal always. Sharp spin, absolutely, because once you pierce the chest, you have to put the sharp spin straight away, safety first, have to put the sharp needle into the sharp spin. Securing device to secure the catheter in place. Now again, some services will give you a special type of dressing. Others will just say, do your best, don't knock it out of place, using um, tape, securing tape, just to secure it in place. So there's real and wonderful things you can do as a paramedic. And on many occasions, you, when you're working in metropolitan centers, you're only 20 minutes away from a hospital. However, when you're rural, you can be hours away, particularly if the, if the, um, if the helicopters are offline. Therefore, it really is in your best interest to really reassess, reassess, and reassess using a stethoscope um, once you've actually decompressed the chest. Now, this is generally speaking the process that you will take when decompressing the chest. Now, the landmarks are listed here. Now, it's the second intercostal space. So these spaces here in between the ribs are called the intercostal spaces. We don't usually count this one. So this is the first, this is the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on and so forth. Um, second intercostal space, space midclavicular line. So in other words, the middle of your clavicle. And they do tend to stay just above the third rib because there's lots of circulation and nerves that, that sit around the, the re region of, the, of the, just the anterior portion, sorry, the superior portion of the, of the third rib. But the reality is it's not always that easy to identify. So as long as you can go with second intercostal space, midclavicular line, notice how even if it was on this side, you are, you are way away from the heart, second intercostal space, midclavicular line. Remembering that if you do have to insert a second one because the, the tension, because it's taken so long to get to hospital, you would insert a second um, 14 gauge cannula laterally away from um, the, the midline because you don't want to be going anywhere near the heart. However, studies have shown that even when you need to do these time and time again, you generally speaking don't even go anywhere near the heart anyway. So this has been a very carefully thought out location. Now there is, there is actually a growing body of evidence to suggest that we should be doing this in the mid axilla space. Axilla is just the line underneath your arm in the fifth intercostal space where they put chest drains. But unfortunately, there's not a strong body of evidence to suggest that's the best place to do it. Um, but rather there's some evidence that says, yes, it still comes with complications, but there's gonna be complications wherever you do it. But just for now, this is where we do it. Second intercostal space, mid clavicular line until the guidelines change. Work together with your crewmates, reassure the patient, place them in a comfortable position. So patient, placing them in a comfortable position might mean leaving them where they are if they're slumped against a wall and they're comfortable. You might need to lay them flat, but then you've got a problem if you're 
you know that to help somebody to breathe, you need to sit them upright to help the mechanics of breathing. But then you're trying to do this skill when they're in an upright position and it's not always easy. So this is where you use your decision-making, communication with your crewmate to try and do what's best for the, for the situation. And we cannot always tell you what to do for every situation because there's too many factors. But try and get your patient into a comfortable position and reassure them, tell them, look, we're gonna place this needle into your chest. It will help you to breathe, stay nice and calm in the meantime. Make sure you prepare your equipment, get your needle out, get your, your, your gloves out, get your, your, your decontamination alcohol wipe ready, get your sharps bin ready. When you're ready to de-sheath the needle, make sure you shout, okay, sharps out, so you can warn everybody around. Um, introduce the needle into that location, push it nice and deeply all the way through the chest wall up to the hilt, take the needle out, stick it in the sharp bin, um, immediately use the patient with sigh of relief and then secure it down. And then of course, have a listen with the stethoscope and get the patient to hospital. Be mindful that you also think about possible seat spine injuries as well. So what we've talked about in this session, guys, is the notion of the time criticality of a tension pneumothorax and the, the requirement to decompress a tension pneumothorax. And guys, please remember that we only ever do this in a tension pneumothorax, not in an open pneumothorax, not in a spontaneous pneumothorax, only in a tension pneumothorax when you see the signs and symptoms and indications that we talked about in this presentation. Know the signs and symptoms, keep reading around this, go on to PubMed, have a look at the signs and symptoms in all the latest journal articles, go into the books and have a look and know how to do the decompression. And of course, you will get chance to have a play around with this in the second workshop. You will be able to um, have a practice on the mannequins, you will be given more instructions. And certainly when you do an advanced life support, there's something called the four H's and four T's, which are the reversible causes of cardiac arrest. One of them is tension in the thorax. So you could save someone's life by knowing how to do this skill. So thank you very much for your attention. My name is Sam Willis, and I look forward to talking to you again shortly, guys. Take care.